You're welcome to this conversation um, between Elle and I. Um, I told a little bit of uh, uh, my story, uh, my journey as, as an artist and as a scholar um, yesterday and the, the place that El Anasi occupies in, in that story. Um, today we are going to uh, talk a little bit about El Anasi's evolution as an artist. Um, as Damien just mentioned in the exhibition itself, we did not seek to organize a retrospective. Um, today, we will do something close to a retrospective in the sense that I will be inviting El Anatsui to sort of reflect on his journey as an artist uh, in the hope that that would help us understand where he's coming from intellectually, where he's coming from artistically, um, and um, how th the multiple experiences he's had uh, coming from Ghana uh, decades ago to Nigeria and to the world uh, at large as a contemporary artist. And so, um, the, the, the conversation that we will be having tonight um, hopefully will expand for, for us the realm of uh, information that uh, we can go home with as we continue to think about Ellen Atsui's work as a contemporary artist who is located in a particular place, but at the same time everywhere uh, in a truly uh, a global um, a fashion. So in thinking about this uh, idea of engaging in a retrospective conversation, I think it, it is appropriate to um, ask the kind of question but I wouldn't phrase it in the same way uh, that one gets asked in, you know, in the United States, I'm sure, in Germany as well, when someone sees you and say, where are you from? And you know what that um, uh, means or implies. Uh, but I'm not going to phrase it that way. Instead, I will um, want to ask L. Uh, about the, the very origins of his practice, right? Uh, how that uh, came about, the, the, the earliest formation of his uh, uh, artistic ideas and intellect. And clearly this was the 1960s. The 1960s is important, they are important. That decade was vital right, to the post-war history of the African continent. Ghana had become independent in 1957, and 18 or so African countries in 1960, and so there was this giddiness, right, um, and aspirational um, uh, work that was going on in the continent at this time, and that was the Ghana that El Anatsui grew up in. And so, El, I would like for you to talk to us a little bit about the impact of this moment in Ghana um, to your early career as a student and how that uh, formed your vision uh, as a contemporary artist. Uh, before you uh, take on that, I sh just should mention that the images on the screen are in a loop, so they will keep going. Uh, if at any point uh, I want for us to talk about a specific work, I'll ask for that image to come back. So for us to follow what's, uh, what's going on uh, in the background. 
So El, uh, to you, could you tell us a bit about um, your growing up in the mid to late 1960s Ghana and the impact that uh, some of the events of the day uh, had on, on you as a young artist? Yeah, thank you. Um, I was about, uh, about 13 years old when my country, the Gold Coast, I was born in the Gold Coast, and in 1957, it became independent Ghana. And uh, well, at that time, I was too young to know anything about uh, politics or yeah, but at the time I got the university and uh, started kind of uh, being uh, conscious of things, um, there was this uh, euphoria of, you know, being independent and being on your own and trying to, you know, the colonial uh, project uh, disrupted uh, everything about life culture and everything. And uh, when uh, we became independent, there was this need to go back and uh, pick up from where you were before the disruption started. And uh, so there was this uh, basic uh, movement, general movement of uh, going back to, we call it a Sankofa syndrome, you know, go back and pick it syndrome, in which we were trying to uh, revive things, religion, culture, and everything that the colonial uh, uh, project said were not okay. We wanted to go back to them and uh, pick them in order to know where to move, you know, uh, certainly, the colonial uh, influence was going to be there in some way, but then uh, the emphasis that we had was on discovering ourselves, kind of a self-identity uh, discovery. And uh, that was about the time that uh, I went to uh, the university, and in the university, I discovered right out towards the end of it that what was going on in the general uh, public about going back to discover oneself wasn't there in terms of the curriculum. Because the curriculum was more or less uh, a lock, stock, and barrel one from an institution in England which uh, the university was affiliated to, you know, the Goldsmith College. And therefore that led some of us to our own search. We want to know about, we can learn about uh, Western art and all kinds of art without knowing about African art. So some of us decided to search for whatever evidence there was of art. And in my uh, own search, I discovered uh, Incidentally, the university was in the, in the, at Kumasi where we have the National Cultural Center, you know, and uh, I used to go there usually on weekends to try to see what is happening. And it was there that I discovered a, a certain body of, uh, of sign, you know, sign uh, language, or, yeah, which uh, was very, instructive to me because uh, these uh, marks or signs which are not represent representational in any way, they were more abstract. And uh, most of them have something to do with uh, some concept or, or such. And uh, incidentally at the time I did this, I did, made this discovery was when we had just learned about the uh, European uh, uh, Renaissance 
I know Renaissance, everything was based on what the eye sees and how to see it well. And, and uh, so I had this uh, grant, you know, um, well, opposite of that, you know, in this. Uh, so I then began to think, okay, then there are two, two or probably many ways of looking at the world. You can look at the world through your eyes or you can look at the world through your, your mind. You know, because uh, if you take a, a concept like uh, omnipotence of God, or a concept like versatility, you know, and you want to encapsulate it, you certainly don't have anything visible before you to, to kind of reproduce. And so this is what has uh, been a very strong uh, influence in my uh, career, you know, the, in this aspect of looking at the world through the mind, trying to distill essences rather than uh, reproduce uh, images, you know. Now, I got this body of, uh, of, of science and spent about four or five years working with them, copying them, trying to understand their structure and how they could mean those things that they said they meant, you know. Like uh, when you talk about the uh, omnipotence of God, which is a, a ten, ten-sided, it, 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 it makes something a reference to the circle, and as well as ten sides, or ten uh, prongs, yeah, on it. And my search eventually led to somebody telling me that, well, oh, it's wonders, and ten is also unity. You know, that's one of the only ones that I got a, a, a kind of a meaning for. You know, but I worked with this for a long time. And when I left school, I uh, continued working with this, and I wanted to see how I can also work, you know, recreate this, and eventually create my own uh, uh, science that have just, something to do with that. Yeah. So yeah. let me just say something about that because I think it's important to um, situate this process that he was going through at this moment. Uh, thinking about the fact that um, he was looking for alternative modes of making uh, work at this time that had to do with this more cultural, political reaction, right, to the end of colonization. That this was something that a generation of African artists were embarking on at this moment. And you take, for instance, someone like Ibrahim El Salahi uh, in the Sudan, who had, like Ella Nazi, gone to a British style academy. Uh, and upon return, uh, to the Sudan, uh, made a presented exhibition of the, these works that he had done in uh, at the Slade at the time. It's either he went to the Goldsmith or went to the Slade if you're from the British colonies, right? So he had come back from the Slade, presented this work in Khartoum, and no one was interested in that, and that caused him a lot of trauma. That his people didn't think he had earned anything these many years in, in, in England. And so this led him in the late 1950s to a search for alternative modes of representation. And what he did, just as El was exploring the Adinkra symbols and signs, Ibrahim El Salahi uh, began to experiment with the calligra Islamic calligraphic text, which of course had uh, you know, this mandate against at least some aspects of Islam against um, iconic representation figures, you know, human figures. And so for him, it was how can these abstract signs and elements of text uh, reveal new ways of figuration? And anyone who knows Ibrahim El Salahi's work will understand that he returned to figuration by through the text and their meaning. And so here's 
uh, concept informing form. And that's exactly what Elanasi is describing that happened in his work during this moment of recalibration, of, of research for new modes of representation. And what then that leads, of course, is in the round panel. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so, so I, I decided to play around with this. And then I decided also that I have to work with local materials, materials that I find in my environment. And that led me to the markets and all kinds of places too. And then I discovered these round trays that uh, they use in the market to, to display wares. You know, these are made in wood. And I thought about, OK, how do you work with this? And uh, the grand idea was to just get hot rods and put them in fire, make them red hot, and use them to, yeah, just... to brand uh, this. So I was using a very low tech you know, low tech, low, low material, very low tech uh, process in order to, uh, so I would take a tray and uh, work on it. You know, most of the time I'll pick a symbol or a sign and put it in the middle. And then on the, the rim. on the rim or the periphery, I will try to uh, do things which I think help to expand the meaning of of the symbol in the middle you know like if i could have a a god's omnipotence the o mm -hmm. this thing and then on the rim i might decide to do more concentric designs you know and con patterns. yeah in order to emphasize that oneness you know of uh, of god idea mm. you know uh, that was about, I did, did this for about four or five years and then came to Nigeria and discovered that they were also in the same uh, mode of trying to rediscover themselves. And I met uh, in the University of Nigeria where I was employed, I met uh, very uh, leading artists, you know, Uke Okeke, Obi and other people who were also struggling to I rediscover things from their culture which had been uh, branded not good uh, by the colonial uh, project. And uh, I got to, well, kindred spirits, you know, were doing almost the same thing in different ways, but I was also influenced by theirs. So I had a combination of both. Uh, the uh, the Ghanaian and then the Nigerian one and especially the one in the in the, in the east of Nigeria which uh, is Igbo land that's Uli they were busy studying Uli and trying to revive it you know and th th this was going on in so many parts of uh, of the country yeah. you know and I uh, joined with this and went on with them. Could you talk a little bit about, a little bit more about this? Um, because the University of Nigeria and Soka uh, at this moment was also going through uh, an intellectual transformation uh, in the sense that Ucho Okeke that he just mentioned uh, was of a, of a slightly older generation to L and had come to the university as um, the head of the, not quite the head of the department, but the most visible uh, artist, the best known uh, artist at the time in the program. And he had been championing in the 1960s this question of research into African artistic traditions as a basis for new work. So it's not so much that they were trying to revive tradition as in let's go back to what our ancestors were doing, but it's in looking at tradition as a resource available to the contemporary artists in the same way that the European Western tradition that they had learned in art school was an alternative resource. And so this was not necessarily a question of rejection of one for the other, but an acknowledgement of the impact of these dual 
heritages, if you will, artistic heritages. So this is what was going on in, at the University of Nigeria and Suka, specifically uh, that they were exploring a particular art form initially called Uli, as he mentioned, which is a wall uh, painting and body drawing tradition practiced by Igbo women um, that depended on the line. And this is important to mention this because when you go to, you look at Elle's work in wood, the tendency for uh, almost scripts and line uh, is very uh, uh, important in the design of the work. And so this combination of the work that these artists were doing at the time and what he was doing created a perfect ma match, if you will, in, in what was happening. And then of course you had very significant humanists in the, you know, both in the literature um, department, Achebe, and, and so forth. So what was this environment like to you getting to uh, Nigeria, but especially in Soka mm -hmm. in the 1970s, and the impact that that had on, on, on your own uh, work among these, as you mentioned rightly, these kindred spirits? Yeah, I think the first thing, the the difference that I saw between uh, our own uh, use of science and uh, the, especially the Uli, Uli, Uli um, sign uh, or drawings, you know, was this idea of use of space. You know, whereas in, in the Ghanaian, this thing, you will pack a lot of signs onto the surface. An, an area, yeah. Yeah, yeah in, in Uli, there was this use of open space animated by just one single uh, line or a single point or a little mark. It's a little mark and just engage the whole uh, wall like this, you know. And so I had to kind of uh, adjust my aesthetics, you know, to now pay more attention to uh, to open space as well. And I find this uh, very interesting because when you see uh, settlements in, uh, in that part of Nigeria, you see that there is a lot of open space. You know, you have settlements, you have a house here, and then there'll be a, a large tract of, uh, of uh, yeah. Vegetation between it and the next one, you know, they weren't kind of compact. You know, I found that uh, very interesting, and uh, it became this, part of this, my this, is this thing. One example, of, yeah. You know, the play of negative and positive space, yeah, uh, which is important in the Uli tradition, uh, traditional drawing and, and mural, and how L, you know, had begun to rethink design you know on a surface and the you know the the use of negative and positive space what mm. in some of the literature say the visual poetry right of line and space as well yeah and um one thing to mention again probably about where i've stayed so long in uh, not only in nigeria but atunsuka was and the time i went there it was uh, a point of ferment. It was a place where almost all the best uh, people you can think about in any discipline, the sciences, the arts, and whatever, whatever you have, uh, were gathered. You know, these are people who have returned after the war to their place of origin in order to help bring it up. And so I became a part of that very vibrant uh, uh, intellectual, committee. intellectual committee, and uh, that helped me kind of grow up a lot, and uh, is partially re responsible for why I've stayed so long, 40, 40 something years over there. And of course, mm -hmm. the, the, the major work you began to do during this period was what eventually became the exhibition Broken Parts. And so arriving in, in Soka, you began to experiment with a different material, with clay. Yeah, well, at this moment. because in Ghana, I was working with uh, 
people who produced trays for me. Now, when I went to Nigeria, I didn't have this. They don't. They don't have that uh, tradition of uh, wooden the trays. trays. Yeah. And so I had to think about something and the commonest medium that anybody can think of anytime, anywhere in the world is clay. So I <laughs> started working with clay right away. And not working with clay, but I wanted to focus clay on certain uh, uh, ideas. And the idea that came to me was that of the pot. You know, I think the pot is one of the most classical forms of, of clay. You know, it, as a sculptor, to me, it says everything that, uh, that the medium clay has to say. You know, it has a property of uh, expansion, and a property of contra contraction, and has a property of fragility. Now, I decided to focus on, on expansion, that's like the port. The pot is very little clay that you shape into, into a big volume, and it has a capacity to break. You know, but when a pot breaks, especially in Africa, it's uh, not like it's lost or life is over. It's rather the opposite way. It assumes more uh, uses you know, comes into more into more uses, more varied uses. Because in a in a in its whole form, it might be a soup pot, or a water or pot, water or, pot a or, container, or, right? or, or yeah, or grain <laughs> grain spot. Mm. But the moment it breaks, it passes into so many other uses. And one of the uh, uses that I found very interesting or intriguing was that it is used as a, a vessel for serving a offerings, offerings to, the gods. to yeah. the gods. So I thought, well, that's a very brilliant idea of a pot, a pot having died being used to, to, <laughs> to serve offerings to people who have departed, you know. And so I thought that... Uh, well, breaking is a form of uh, regeneration, you know, because uh, when you talk about breaking, then uh, it's uh, destruction. Then you're talking about uh, an opportunity for something to start a new growth. So you can't start a new growth if you, if you are still whole. You might continue growing the same old way. So one uh, way to think about this is that breakage, death, is a moment of transformation, right? Yes. That, that it assumes even greater significance. Because when it was whole, it served human beings. When it is broken, it serves the ancestors and the deities who are more, of course, the, who occupy a higher state in the cosmological scheme. So the broken pot then becomes more important symbolically than the whole pot, right? So this notion uh, also, of course, ties into the idea of reincarnation, right? Mm -hmm. That the, the broken pot becomes something else uh, from the moment it dies, it breaks, right? And so this uh, idea became very important, but also on a technical level, mm -hmm. right, in terms of, you know, uses of grog and... Oh, yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. So, my experiments or works with uh, clay uh, focused on this idea of the broken pot, yeah, which I did for about uh, four or five years, you know, with clay before uh, moving on to something else. And uh, what did I move on to? I think I moved on to clay, yeah, I went to wood. You know, I started with wood and I'm back to wood. But wood this time not as tray, not as a, a utilitarian object, but wood on its own. Yeah, and this I went was something that happened. I went to a residency yeah. somewhere in the U.S. Uh, Massachusetts, and mm -hmm. and uh, during that residency was when I 
chanced upon the idea of using the chainsaw as an artist's tool. You know, it's not like that. I hadn't used it before. I, I, we've used it in the in the for many years. You know, we we would on a yearly basis go into the woods in order to log. You know, wood in order to, uh, to to bring to the school to work with, but this time, in the quietude and uh, concentration of my residence in Massachusetts, 22. when I started making the lines on on the wood with the chainsaw, I saw that it had very unique quality. There was something about it, you know, we talked about power, we talked about rush, and uh, so many things. And so I decided to uh, explore it as a tool. And uh, as a tool, one of the things that it does very easily and very effectively is to make a line, not, not just any line, but a straight line. Unbending line. Yeah. Because uh, it, initially I, I experimented trying to see if I can make sea scrolls, and, but it was most dangerous. So you and when I understood, <laughs> when when I understood it, when I understood it, that it's designed to make some straight lines, I focused on the idea of the straight line, and then ideas of. Uh, colonization and all these things, and the idea of uh, the Berlin Conference, okay, we are in Germany, so Berlin <laughs> Conference, where, <laughs> where probably a ruler or something was used to draw straight lines, you know. Uh, so this led me to... Uh, let, let me, I think maybe uh, some people don't quite get where you're going or what you're uh, okay. pointing to, um, so let's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Talk a little bit, bit about that. Um, so you just mentioned Berlin mm. conference and rulers and, yeah. and stuff um, and colonization, um, which of course is a reference to the 1884-85 uh, Congo-Berlin conference mm. whereby European powers gathered uh, the German chancellor at the time, Otto von Bismarck, uh, brought them together to basically lay formal claims to African territories. And so they drew up the maps, uh, you know, ownership rights, uh, acknowledge who owned what, and those maps remain till today as the map of African countries. Some merged over time, but it was in Berlin that the continent of Africa was divided up to, you know, takers, including, of course, the vast territory of the Congo, which was given to the king of Belgium. And by the time he finished uh, the population in seven or eight years, the population reduced from 20 million to about 10 million as a result of the viciousness of um, the regime of you know, the so-called Congo Free State. And of course, that country has yet to recover from that devastation. And so this idea of the chainsaw as this vicious tool that is unbending, you know, that uh, is almost untamable. Uh, he tried to tame it and then realized that it's impossible to tame it. And so he had to use, he had to exploit its, its inherent power. Uh, mm -hmm. power. Mm -hmm. And so the connection between the viciousness, and you can see in this image, the chainsaw is what he used to cut the you know the section on your on your left, right? Yeah, on your left. Which one is that? Uh, that's this. Oh, okay. Uh, and so, and then burned it with uh, with oxyacetylene flame, which is what gives it the black um, color. So, the chainsaw and fire, you know, are, dis are forces of destruction for the most part, which he has now retooled as you know creative tools. You know, the chainsaw and fire. So it's almost a way of defying as it were, the, you know, this history right, of colonization as a moment of the destruction of African cultures and societies. And so this re, re, 
um, re-articulation of that experience of colonization is important in, you know, to our understanding of the choices that he makes uh, about certain tools and how he deploys them. And so it's important to, to highlight this fact that Earl's work um, is very technically oriented, but oftentimes those techniques are informed by concepts and ideas that are very fundamental to thinking about African histories pre and post uh, colonization. But of yeah. course, you also introduce certain other tools, right, beyond yeah. the chainsaw, mm -hmm. uh, the more controllable tools as, as it were, and then the dynamic between the, the two as this work that we're looking at uh, tells us. So what other tools did you bring to, you know, into play? Well, I, I even brought in the hand tools like chisels and gouges, which do things very slowly, yeah. but more precisely, you can do more uh, ornate things with them. But that takes a long, a lot of time. And I think I explored the contrast between these two uh, media uh, or processes in uh, in the work uh, erosion. erosion erosion downstairs, which. Uh, I uh, created in uh, in Brazil in response to the the, the Earth, Summit. Earth, Earth Summit in ninety three and ninety two uh, right. ninety two yeah yeah uh huh and <laughs> <laughs> now the the idea behind this work was to talk about uh, cultures, how cultures form. Cultures take a long, long, long time to form. But if you come, or you, uh, you come with power, great power against such cultures, you can easily destroy them in no time. Because I, I spent uh, about almost a month doing the, the ornate, cultural yeah. things with, uh, with, with, with hand tools and other things. And within two or three hours with a chainsaw, I was able to cover or destroy more ground than, uh, than I had spent a month uh, covering. You know, so it's uh, my idea about the fact that, uh, well, colonization to start with, industrialization and mechanization and all these things uh, uh, provided uh, to mankind tools that uh, they weren't able to really control. We've over overused the power. And that is why one of the reasons why we have uh, the environmental uh, pro uh, problems, you know, that was my uh, idea about it. But there's another mm. element to it as well. The, uh, you know, this process of very deliberate, meticulous carving of the surface of this large log of wood, it's almost, a, you know, an intimate encounter with with this material and um, turning it into you know, an iconic you know form and yet within a few minutes the chainsaw complete or nearly completely destroyed the entire thing so here we see a metaphor for erosion whether we think about environmental erosion which can you know within in a few minutes, there's a landslide and a 2,000-year-old forest just gets destroyed. Or we think of cultural erosion, right? And of course, in Brazil, the, the Earth Summit was more about the environmental, you know, the coming environmental disasters, climate change, and so forth. And so here we see, again, the process um, mapping onto the idea Right of uh, of his work uh, during this this period, and so erosion uh, must be seen in the in context of 
the other magnificent piece in the exhibition, uh, Rising Sea, which reflects on his uh, long meditation on the question of the environment uh, across different um, media. But let's talk about the late, later phase. Uh, uh, in the late 1990s, you began to search for new um, material uh, for, for your work. And you tended to either uh, look at um, old wood um, or new material beyond wood, you know, thinking about the, uh, the greater uh, panels that they use for processing mm -hmm. cassava mm -hmm. and the milk uh, mm -hmm. tins and, and so forth. So at that point, were you getting tired of wood? Well, uh, or normally, was wood not saying any, you know, much, much more to you? Yeah, it's <laughs> not. It's not like you get tired with something. It's like something new comes or shows itself up. Normally, uh, consciously uh, or unconsciously, the artist is always looking for new ways of uh, maybe presenting even old ideas, you know, and. Uh, just keep working organically, and the thing, or a new medium, or a new process, or a new idea would bring itself organically. Uh, I wasn't tired with wood. I still work with wood, uh, but uh, <laughs> but I had this uh, new. Well, you, when you marry a new wife, you know. <laughs> <laughs> You leave your you leave your girlfriends. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> nah, so uh, the metal the metal things came in uh, conscious uh, 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 unconsciously, and when I started working with them, I saw that they had more uh, uh, to say. So you, you know, you in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a new way. So you fell in no. love with the metal. Yeah. <laughs> so generally my my this thing just goes that way i'm looking for new uh, materials or new ways of doing things and uh, the, the old yeah. one when you embark on a new thing that the, the old one tends to take a back stage yeah. i you think know. there's something to be said about the idea that you went from wood to metal, but it's again mm -hmm. a specific kind of metal, right? Because when we think about metal sculpture, we're thinking about massive, heavy stuff, right? Um, but here we're thinking about very light, very you know, fragmentary things, yeah. rather mm -hmm. than whole volumina mm -hmm. um, uh, objects and, mm -hmm. and so forth. So, and, and one looks at this and thinks about the wood sculpture that they are, you know, in, in slats rather than, you know, whole volumes or panels, mm -hmm. uh, or think about the clay. Mm -hmm. And so here you're working, you're shifting towards a different material, yeah. but then you're thinking of them as pieces. Yeah, I think there is something that runs through all of them, right from, uh, even right from the, the wooden trays. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have, uh, we have the wooden trays. The strategy that I used in displaying them was that of uh, clustering them. Mm -hmm. And once you cluster, once you have the ones you have numbers, mm -hmm. then the tendency is that you're going to be playing with those numbers. You're going to play with arrangements and all kinds of things. It's like an amoeba. Mm -hmm. Amoeba is constantly changing shape. And I think human beings too. We, we do change, but we don't notice it. <laughs> So it was uh, important, since yeah, so, you're thinking about formless form, that it, the parts had to be broken in order to allow for... Yeah, yeah. when, yeah, when you break a part, then you have uh, numbers again to work with. And uh, with the wood, the chainsaw, uh, the slabs, you know, where you number them, but that's not a final thing because anybody is free to rearrange and uh, get something new out of the same thing that you have presented. 
I was telling you know, one of your, so, I was telling one of your collectors that uh, he should pay serious attention to this, you know, idea, because that's a way changing. to, yeah, that's a yeah. way to brag to your friends. You might mm. change the design of the work, and then six months later, you invite them and change it up again. I say, wow, you have more than one Ella Natsui. <laughs> <laughs> And you're like, yep, the other one is in the other room. <laughs> right? so. Well, yeah, I think that uh, what this has, because I keep telling people that it's not, it's something, it's a proposal that I've made. You can, free, you can freely make your own uh, statement out of it. You're not tied to it. But you find that people want to always take dictation from artists. They don't want to change anything they want it to be in that way and uh, so it's enabled me to know about human beings you know as people who uh, are very um, they like rules yeah they like rules and they are used to uh, custom it's a customary way of it's done and therefore I shouldn't change it you know uh, so, so let's uh, talk then about the experience of installing triumphant scale with works mm -hmm. coming from major museums across mm -hmm. the planet and yeah. they are having their mm -hmm. instructions on mm -hmm. how to install mm -hmm. as you know, curators in the room know, mm -hmm. you know, you're giving a file how to install this important work mm -hmm. and they all come from all over the place and it's El Anazi's work of course, they forget. And then they arrive, and what happens to all those how to install, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, it's 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 it reemphasizes the the point I've made earlier on mm -hmm. that people are used to things and they don't want to change. You know, uh, if somebody has created a data and want you to play around with it, and you think, oh. It's only one way of uh, working with that data. Then uh, it's kind of trying to beat the idea behind the whole uh, form. The so let me then ask you, if, as you say, you let you know, curators to decide how to display the work, um, are you always satisfied with? <laughs> Certainly, you can't <laughs> always be satisfied with things. As, as a human being, you, know, you there are times you come in and you find that. Oh. <laughs> but but you don't want to impose your own uh, ideas upon the people. You want uh, their ideas to be valid. Also, they also re represent a valid view or a valid statement, you know. So you allow it. But there are cases that I have to uh, intervene <laughs> and, and impose. Yeah. Yeah. So you basically... And, and, uh, it, it's, uh, I've mentioned this in a couple of places before that... Uh, the conservative conservatism that you see in life is, uh, I expect it to be more in, in the churches or such places than in regular life. I had uh, done work for the Vatican for an exhibition uh, some years ago. And uh, when I sent the work, I was curious. I wanted to know how Vatican is going to deal with you because it seems I give freedom to you for to configure the work. How is Vatican going to do it? So I, because of that, I traveled. I traveled to the opening, and uh, to my very grand uh, surprise, I saw that they had done the most revolutionary. <laughs> thing about installing the work. You know, something that I haven't seen anybody do, even me myself. Yeah. They install it in such a way that, you know, it, it's kind of in this format. 
but they threw a huge portion of it behind <laughs> and this thing and only a, a portion was left. So the, the for, that this format was completely lost, you know, and they had something else. And when I saw it, I was very, very excited with it. <laughs> and, uh, but I haven't had co courage myself to, I'm also conservative. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had courage myself to, to try that anywhere else yet. <laughs> okay, so before we open up uh, for, um, for questions, uh, let's just talk briefly about the, I'm not sure if that work is the big elephant in the room, but it feels like it, that's gallery two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, the massive, immersive yeah. work. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been asked so many times how the fill in the gap, were you able to produce a work like this um, for, for this exhibition? You know, how did it happen? You know, is it one million people, you know, two billion? Mm -hmm. You know, or so how did that work come to be? Of uh, Logo te te technically, yeah, yeah technically, yeah. you certainly have. Well, I've been working with so many people over the years now, uh, but with this, to fill that kind of space, you needed more, more hands beyond the 20, 40 people who work with me uh, in the in the studio. So I had to call on the the community, how to engage the community itself. And eventually we had about a uh, hundred and something people working, yeah, working on this in, in over a year, you know, to create uh, that. And yeah, by community, uh, you mean like farmers, teachers, students, yeah. professional types? Yeah, people yeah. living just around the, yeah. the environment of the studio, you know, who are engaged. You know, if they have spare time, they work on it. And uh, so, so many people, including women, children, you know, all worked on it. And one thing that I always see in this uh, kind of works is that you feel the presence of of the the energy that their hands you know so many hands touching something you know lend a lot of uh, energy or infuse a lot of energy into that thing so i think i think to 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 and it's important to reemphasize this point that um, here, what we have is uh, a different model of art making and art presentation. It takes a community to raise a work of art, um, and it takes a community to present a work of art, you know, community of curators. Um, and that the artwork changes over time, almost like life itself. Uh, it grows, it changes form, uh, you know, but it, of course, hopefully does not die um, in the way that life um, operates. Yeah, and also the fact that uh, I've always uh, believed that uh, art should present us with things that we don't know, that uh, it's not always if the thing is so clear, then it, it, it loses something, you know, and uh, so I, I create marks that you can't make meaning out of, you know, like you're in the world, but you don't know the world, you know, <laughs> that's one of the titles of the work. That, that, that has been a... a a phrase that has informed most of my this thing. I am not here to uh, reproduce Adinkra or Uli or science, which people understand, mm -hmm. but to create, add my own uh, 
creations to eat. Otherwise, I'm not adding anything to the, to the world. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, actually, I think that's on, on, on a perfect note. I mean, we're talking about languages and we're talking about discourses and we've just had a conversation and a discourse tonight. Um, and I would just like to say before we close that uh, this is not the, the end of the discourse, um, not even here in Munich. Um, thanks to the generous support of, um, of our sponsors and patrons, um, we have invited some thinkers, we've invited architects, we have curators who are going to come throughout the run of this show over the next couple, uh, next couple of months. We have Nadine Sigurd from Iwi Liwa House, we have Francis Carre, we have David Ajaye, and we have many, many more who are, who are going to be announced, who are all going to be talking uh, about, about Elle's work, and we're going to be discussing all of the, all of the different ways um, that one can sort of interpret this work and one can read this work. But just before we finish, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Chica, thank Okwi, to thank Ellen Atsui's incredible studio, as well as the studio and the team here in Munich, and of course, to thank Ellen Atsui for bringing us this phenomenal show. Thank you very much. <laughs>